I'm Raj Kumar, President and Editor-in-Chief of DevX. We're here in Songdo, South Korea at the headquarters of the Green Climate Fund. I'm with the head of that fund, the Executive Director, Yannick Lamarck. And this is incredible timing because we were just a couple of days before you were about to get on a plane to Paris for a major replenishment of the fund, which we want to talk about. Uh, you've been in this role just about six months and you landed kind of right into the fire. This is an organization that went through some tumult, some challenges. You kind of come in to reboot it and are now on the cusp of what looks like it might be a successful replenishment. I wanna talk about that in a second, but first, for people who have been following some of the stories around the Green, Green Climate Fund over the last few years, what is the current status of the fund? Where do we stand uh, given some of the challenges in the past that we've gotten through that period? How do you describe the current situation here? Well, first, Raj, it's great to have you here in Songdo. Uh, many thanks for uh, making the effort to come to see us. The, by the end of the year, the uh, Green Climate Fund will have allocated almost 100% of uh, the resources it's mobilized in 2014 and 2015, and about 70% of uh, the project uh, approved during this period will be under implementation. And that was that's important because and that was a key challenge in the past, right? Uh, the it, projects weren't being implemented quickly enough. It's important because uh, the uh, among the many uh, performance indicators for a fund is uh, how long did it take you to allocate 100% uh, of uh, your resources? Mm -hmm. And by and large, we are on par with any uh, similar uh, trust fund in the world, which is not a small fit given that uh, uh, the Green Climate Fund is actually an independent uh, institution. Right. It's not a multi partner, uh, multi partner trust fund from World Bank or from uh, the United Nations system. And thus, uh, my predecessors had to basically build it from scratch yeah. uh, under the guidance of the board. They had to develop all the uh, required uh, policy uh, doc uh, foundations more than 60 policies, they had to recruit uh, the staff and they had to uh, initiate a very uh, uh, ambitious uh, origination uh, process. So by the end of this year, we will have uh, allocated 100% uh, of our resources, that means we will have basically originated uh, and uh, appraised and approved and started the implementation of uh, the, uh, the initial uh, capitalization. And therefore, our board decided in 2018 to start uh, this uh, first replenishment process. Mm. The, uh, over, I've been on the job for the past six months, and indeed it has been quite, uh, quite a frantic period because uh, uh, part of the job of the executive director is to basically uh, outreach uh, to all the potential uh, financial contributors and therefore first report on what has been achieved during the uh, initial uh, fund mobilization period and uh, 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 consult on what could be the main uh, objective of the first replenishment period. Yeah, and just so people understand the context of this fund, why it's so important, this sits kind of under the COP process, right? And this is all about how do you get developing countries to mitigate and adapt in a, in a world of a rapidly changing climate. Uh, how, how do you see the kind of unique value proposition of the Green Climate Fund. There are other funds out there that work on climate. There are many multilateral development banks. You, know, you used to be in the UN system. How do you make the case of the, of the uniqueness and the unique value proposition of this fund? Well, the Green Climate Fund uh, was designed to provide a double dividend. The, uh, the, first one, the first thing is that it was designed to basically uh, catalyze, use limited public uh, resources to catalyze much, much larger uh, private financial flows. And we had been undone with uh, four uh, uh, strategic capabilities. The first one is that uh, we are the most uh, open fund in the industry. The Green Climate Fund uh, uh, can partner with a very uh, wide range of uh, entities from some of the largest uh, commercial banks in the world, such as uh, Mitsubishi Bank or uh, BNP Paribas to some of the most uh, innovative uh, uh, local uh, NGOs. And so that's the first thing. The second thing is that we are country driven. The idea was to make sure that uh, the uh, Green Climate Fund will uh, be fully aligned with uh, national priorities. And, uh, and for that, we have, we have de facto, we have a number of capacity development programs. Mm -hmm. We are de facto the largest source of capacity uh, development uh, for uh, climate change, where we can help uh, developing countries develop short, uh, medium, uh, long-term uh, strategic plan. 
for example, to envisage uh, uh, what will be a world by 2050 where we will have achieved net zero emission, but we will have to contend with 1.5 degrees Celsius, if not more, in temperature increase. What does it mean in terms of a new technological mix, new socio-economic uh, uh, opportunities, and new human security risk from uh, from a polar world shift of ecosystems to uh, yeah. to extreme weather events? So you're you're working at the systemic level, yeah. not just at the project and level, at, and at the systemic level. So that's one of the things, uh, and so the and the idea that's. Uh, we the, this after enable developing countries to identify what are the three four transformative initiatives they, uh, they should immediately initiate in order to be ready and to strive in this brave new world of uh, 2050. So that's the second thing we are country driven and we work also among our partners with uh, national institutions. The third uh, uh, the third uh, function uh, the third strategic capabilities we have been handled with that we can provide any kind of grant, non-grant instruments. We are capital agnostic. Yeah. So we start from the needs of our partners. If our partners need grant for policy de-risking, we can provide it. If our partners need, for example, equity capitals for SMEs or guarantees for financial de-risking, we can provide it. And the fourth one, which for me is also critical, is that we allocate uh, as much resources to adaptation than to uh, mitigation. And this put us in a unique position to uh, maximize uh, uh, development uh, co-benefits between uh, adaptation, mitigation, and poverty uh, reduction. So this is, and this, all these strategic capabilities together enable us to uh, to foster a paradigm shift mm -hmm. toward low emission and climate resilient development in uh, developing countries and give a fighting chance to projects that would have been deemed too risky uh, or, uh, uh, the, uh, or too innovative to, to, be, to, to see the light of the day. So this is one of our development uh, dividends. The other one, which is what I, bet, I guess you were referring to, Raj, yeah. is that uh, we, we, are, we are also a political instrument. We are the, uh, one of the operating uh, uh, entity of uh, the financial mechanisms of the UNFCCC. And part of our uh, part of our mandate is also to uh, to uh, support uh, international climate uh, negotiation. Right. We are part of a compact between the global north and the global south, uh, where uh, increased ambition in means of implementations will enable increased ambition in adaptation and mitigation. So our job is to encourage. Uh, developing countries to raise their climate ambitions because we will be able to realize them. Yeah, in many ways, if you can have a Paris Agreement, uh, but if you don't get to the point where developing countries have the means to actually implement that, and this is what the Green Climate Fund is all about, which is probably not surprising why the U.S. administration and President Trump pulled out. You know, President Obama had committed $3 billion, and then one billion of that materialized during his presidency. President Trump pulled back on the remaining $2 billion. Now you're heading into this replenishment. And all eyes are on, you know, what, what is the number going to be? How, how big is this going to be? Will, will this fund continue to have the kind of ambitions that it had in the past? Um, but just, just before we talk about that replenishment overall, are we through the dysfunctional period of this fund? Can you kind of give a clarifying statement on that, on that point? We had a board that had a lot of dysfunction. You're, I think, the third executive director now. Can you, can you definitively say the fund is through that period? But the... Um we had a board uh, in uh, July 2018 that basically uh, uh, got hung up on a, on a few issues and therefore could not uh, approve uh, the portfolio that had been submitted to that board uh, uh, at the, on that occasion. The, uh, but what is, and this became quite, uh, quite well known. The, what is less uh, well known is that the following board did approve every single uh, standing uh, project. And the fact that by the end of the year we will have allocated 100% of our resources uh, uh, shows that actually it's a, it's, an, uh, it's a fund that, deli that has delivered uh, on the key uh, objective of the fund, which is to basically transfer uh, money. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, also, um, when you look at the uh, portfolio of this fund, the, you can see uh, a dramatic uh, uh, improvement in uh, the innovation uh, embedded in the portfolio. And uh, for example, uh, 
the uh, the fund now is using is uh, fully leveraging his strategic capabilities to create a new type of uh, blended finance. The uh, one of the projects we submitted to our board uh, last uh, July was for a 1.1 billion dollar investment in integrated solar and water. Mm -hmm. That you, you you use solar to pump water to a high point, and after during at night you use water to generate hydroelectricity. So this enables you to have renewable energy as what we call a base load energy. Mm -hmm. For these 1.1 uh, billion dollar uh, projects, we provided 60 million dollars of first loss equity that did enable uh, the project proponent to mobilize 400 million dollars of senior equity mm -hmm. and should enable them to get 600 million dollars of uh, uh, commercial uh, loans mm -hmm. and uh, if everything goes well uh, once the project has been commissioned in uh, after four or five years we might be able to sell our uh, first lost equity position to uh, the private sector that's and a great example of blended finance, which, as you said, it, of new blended finance. We talk a lot about blended finance, but there are not actually that many great examples of it. That's a very good one. It's uh, and it's it's uh, it's really a new type of blended finance because often blended finance has been about uh, using public resources to soften the terms of uh, loans. Mm -hmm. While here you are speaking about uh, using public resources to uh, de-risk uh, uh, projects. And you and can get the, the upside of that risk as a, as a fund. The, but the beauty of it is that often people speak about leveraging ratio as one of the uh, effectiveness criteria of public money. How much money, how much money right. from the private sector do you mobilize, leverage? Right. Uh, in that case, if we get back uh, our money, you cannot calculate the leveraging ratio because you cannot divide something by, uh, by zero. And uh, the uh, and so there you can see when you it was one example of uh, of uh, the new generation of projects that GCF has been supporting, which are which are basically pushing the uh, development front line. And for a fund to be in that position to become uh, a major knowledge center in uh, in climate finance after only four years. It's not. Uh, it's not that uh, uh, usual. So I think it's fair to say that uh, this fund, like any other fund, has gone through some growing pain. Mm -hmm. It has not stopped growing. It will not reach uh, maturation, full maturity, before the end of GCF one. You know, it's take often ten years to to fully develop an institution. Right. The original mm -hmm. idea was in 2010. It started in 2014. Yeah. Now here we are about to go into the replenishment, and I understand it's a long cycle, it's an open process, but you're going to have this big conference in Paris in two days. Uh, so give us a sense, what is the headline number you're expecting to, to generate from this conference? And give, give us an idea of what's underneath that number. How is it going to go? The uh, objective is to at least match the uh, initial uh, uh, pledges in uh, 2014, the, which is here again given that uh, uh, some uh, some fairly large financial contributors are not to participate in this uh, in this first round of replenishment will be a major achievement, especially the United States, which is three billion, about thirty percent of the original uh, yeah, pledge, twenty five percent of the world economy. The uh, it's uh, but uh, this achievement will have been uh, will have uh, if we if we. If we succeed in at least matching uh, the 2014 replenishment, this will have been made, made, made possible thanks to the fact that so, a number of countries have decided to double their uh, uh, contribution, uh, initial contribution. And for example, Norway and Germany uh, took that decision. They pledged a doubling uh, just before uh, COP24 in Katowice. And uh, UK and uh, France did the same at uh, G7. All in all, 16 countries have already uh, announced that uh, they will contribute to the first replenishment of the GCF. 90% uh, are increasing, 50% so far are doubling. Yeah, that's impressive. So what do you think will be the number that you generate this week out of the conference? You know, it's uh, very difficult to come with a final number before the last minute of There's the, always of the last minute negotiations, I know. <laughs> and, uh, but, uh, so far, we are at 7.4 uh, billion dollars. If you take uh, if you take into account what has been uh, uh, pledged before Katowice at the G7 in August and the uh, UN Climate Summit, so uh, I hope we will meet uh, the 9.3 uh, billion dollars of uh, 
the first uh, pledging conference of 2014. And like uh, in 2014, uh, we will have to continue uh, mobilizing resources as uh, GCF1 progress. Right, it's an open process and you'll have other opportunities. Are there any private individuals like the Gates Foundation, uh, you know, private foundations that have contributed? That is the case for the Global Fund and the Global Health uh, sp Space. Is that happening yet for a Green Climate Fund? No, not yet. The uh, sub, uh, subnational governments have contributed to the uh, Green Climate Fund, but uh, so, so far uh, no, uh, no private foundation. The, uh, the idea is to finalize uh, the uh, overall pledging conference uh, at the end of uh, October. And after, most likely, uh, we will basically reach out to uh, what I would call non-traditional financial contributors for, uh, for the GCF, and this should include foundations. Okay, makes sense. I know we need to let you go to Paris shortly here, but one last question, which is um, kind of a big picture question. You know, we're in an interesting moment when it comes to climate. Um, I think I saw something from the UN recently that June was the hottest month on record and July was the hottest month on record. Uh, we had these two big reports, um, you know, about biodiversity of a million species uh, that, that may go entirely extinct and the 1.5 report that came out this summer. There's other reports coming later this year. It seems like 2019, of course, we have young people in the streets all over the world. It seems like this is a particular moment in time. Now, Paris was one, one real moment in time when it comes to the climate movement. But 2019 seems to be one too. And how do you how do you think about that? Where do you put the Green Climate Fund in that context? Well, I've been uh, I've been working uh, on uh, on the development, climate, and finance for the past 30 years, and I've seen a number of uh, ups and downs in terms of uh, awareness. For me, what is uh, uh, truly unique uh, about 2019 is that uh, first it's increasingly difficult to deny the reality of climate change. When James Hansen in the 80s uh, said that uh, we will see the first effect uh, of climate change at the turn of the 21st century, a lot of people were very skeptical. No, 18 of uh, the uh, uh, the uh, of the most uh, of the warmest year uh, in uh, in history of the 20 warmest year have taken place since the turn of the century. So it's uh, we, we are seeing the, uh, the impact. And so it's increasingly difficult to deny uh, the materiality of climate change. The second thing is that so we, there is no a voice for intergenerational inequity. The uh, climate change is basically fundamentally uh, unfair. Those who have contributed the least are to suffer the most. Women will be more affected than men. The poor, Will be more affected than the rich, and uh, the but you had and the young and the young people will be more affected than those of my generation. There was a voice for gender inequality. There was a voice for income inequality. There was no voice for generational uh, intergenerational inequality. And in 2006, uh, 2019, we have seen the emergence of that voice. And uh, I believe it will have a dramatic impact on political calculus uh, worldwide. And hopefully that will contribute to more and more pressure for funds like yours as you head into this reply. It's uh, the, uh, if you look at uh, some of the most uh, active advocates for uh, the GCF replenishment, it includes a number of, uh, of uh, basically high schoolers and uh, college uh, students. Yeah. The, uh, this, uh, the new generation uh, has fully understood uh, what was at stake with uh, successful uh, and ambitious recapitalization, replenishment of the GCF, and they have taken in their own hands to advocate for it. Well, we'll be following this very closely. Good luck to you this week. Raj, it's a pleasure. Thank you.